Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship. I want to say a special welcome to any guests that might be here today. And also want to welcome those who are joining us online. Glad to have you. For those who don't know me, I'm Scott Summers. I'm filling in for Pastor Kurt today, who unfortunately contracted COVID. Prayers are with Pastor Kurt that took his home resting and uh, doing the quarantine so he doesn't pass it on to anyone else. And I wanted to give just a little context for our worship service today. As you may know, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. Mm -hmm. And Pentecost is the day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that's 50 days after Easter in our church calendar because from Acts 2 it indicates that the Holy Spirit came 50 days after Jesus uh, was raised from the dead. And so last Sunday was 50 days <laughs> celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and power and wind and flames of fire. And now, today is what is known in our church calendar as Trinity Sunday, or the Holy Trinity, and traditionally follows Pentecost Sunday every year. And on this Sunday, we think about the, uh, how the early followers of Jesus had to, to decide how they understood God and relationship to Jesus and the Holy Spirit as they had experienced it. And so over time, they came up with what's now called the Doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, we believe in, in one God who's known to us in three ways, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the one and three are the three and one. And so I mention this because uh, it's no coincidence that in worship today, you'll see lots of uh, that language that will illustrate this, the Doctrine of the Trinity. Well, with that, I invite you to stand as we begin worship then. And we begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and as we begin our worship, we also acknowledge the Diné and the Hopi peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Flagstaff area on which we meet. And we pay respect to the elders past and present of all indigenous peoples of Arizona and the United States. Amen. We continue now with our opening hymn.
And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Okay, the first reading is from Proverbs 8, 1 through 4, and 22 through 31. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. Where there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delight and delight in the human race. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do the psalm, and one of the wings start, and I'll start with the wings, and then the middle of you will do both. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens. Out of the mouths of infants and children, you have set up a fortress against your enemies to silence the bow and adventure. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what are men mortals that you should be mindful of them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you have made them little less than divine. With glory and honor you crown them. You have made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Today's second reading is from Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We're reading from Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace on which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing in the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, I invite you to stand in for the reading of the gospel. And the Holy Gospel for this day is written in the Gospel according to John, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And this Gospel reading is part of what's known as Jesus' farewell address, where he's preparing his disciples for the time when he will leave them. 
And in this particular passage, Jesus uh, gives mention of his relationship then to God the Father and to the Holy Spirit. John 16, 12 to 15. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is word of God, word of life. Praise you, O Christ. So, what do you think? Is, is, this, is this table solid? Is the, is the chair you're sitting in solid? We, we, we kind of hope so, right? <laughs> um, but I think science would say yes and no. And as I understand it, this table and your chair, they're tangible physical objects, and they're made up of particles in motion, bouncing off each other, coming in and out of existence billions of times in billions of a second. And so your chair appears to be solid, but according to quantum physics, that is a bit of an illusion. <laughs> it has weight and mass and shape and texture, and yet your chair is ultimately a relationship of energy, or atoms bonded to each other in a particular way that allows you to sit on that chair and be supported. So things like chairs and tables and parking lots and planets appear to be solid, but according to science, they are at their core endless, frantic movements of energy. So everything is in motion, just like our planet. And we're told that the, the Earth is moving around the sun at approximately 66,000 miles an hour, and it's doing that while it's also rotating uh, on its axis at about 1,000 miles an hour. So those times when you feel like your head is spinning, it is. <laughs> yeah. No excuse. <laughs> There's a, a favorite book of mine by one of my favorite authors. He's a Christian, a progressive Christian author, speaker, podcaster, and that's Rob Bell. Some of you may have are familiar with his writings. But I, one of his books that I really uh, enjoy and appreciate is a book entitled, What We Talk About When We Talk About God. And in his book, Rob Bell connects scientific discovery with our understanding of God. And he views science and faith as, quote, dance partners, which both help us to understand God. And so today on this Trinity Sunday, I'd like for us to think about how we understand God and the nature of God and how science can help uh, influence or uh, help, help us to think about the very nature of, of God. So I want to back up for just a moment and think about how the world is ordered. And I know that I'm on, I'm on shaky ground here because there might be some science teachers here, I know there's some medical people here, so I know I'm a little, little on shaky ground, but I think I can just back a little bit to kind of the basics of what we know from science. And we know that the building block for the universe is the atom, and an atom is extremely small. In fact, the size of an atom in relationship to a golf ball is the same as the relationship of a golf ball to planet Earth. And so an atom is extremely small. And they're made up of even smaller parts called protons, neutrons, and what? What's yeah. it? Yeah, you, you guys are good. <laughs> right? And the, uh, the protons and neutrons are at the center of the atom, which is called the nucleus. And physicists have been able to discover technology to explore 
the subatomic world of atoms, which is way too small for me to, to get my head around. But what pioneer scientists have learned is that electrons don't orbit the nucleus in a continuous and consistent manner. What they do is they disappear in one place and then they reappear in another without traveling the distance in between. And so particles vanish and then they show up somewhere else, leaping from one location to another with no way to predict when or where they will come and go. Right? Fascinating, yeah? <laughs> they, they, they're these uh, particles in motion that don't follow typical laws of science, right? They appear, disappear, reappear, not going the distance in between, but taking different patterns. Sounds like Christians. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like, like, like the Christian faith, isn't it? Good, good comparison. Well, you know, you've heard of Niles Bohr. He was one of the first to come to terms with this strange new world, subatomic world. And he uncovered what he called these movements or quantum leaps. Yeah? And quantum theory now is responsible for things we take for granted now, like things like x-rays and MRIs and fiber optics and computers. It's all based on these, the movement of these molecules. And quantum physics began to realize that, that particles are constantly in motion, exploring all the possible paths from point A to point B at the same time. So they are simultaneously everywhere and nowhere. And now, I would make a terrible science teacher, but you might, you might see where I'm headed with this. Huh? <laughs> As a theologian, it's fascinating to think that the essence of the universe are particles that are simultaneously everywhere and nowhere. And you think that might help our understanding of, of God and God's relationship to the universe and to each one of us? So everything is moving. Matter is ultimately energy, and our interactions with energy alter reality because our world is an interconnected web of relationships with nothing isolated, alone, or unaffected. And isn't it interesting that the psalmist wrote hundreds of years ago, in Psalm 8, verse 1 and 2, which we heard earlier, verse 1 and 2, the psalmist wrote, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, you whose glory is chanted above the heavens, out of the mouths of infants, and children. So even the psalmist hundreds of years ago recognized that, that, that God as creator is everywhere. Can't be contained anywhere. God is in the heavens. God is on the earth. And in our modern world, scientists are constantly surprised by just how much more there is to the universe and even expands our understanding of, of the magnificence of God. Which leads to you. You know what? You are fascinating. <laughs> you lose 50 to 150 strands of hair a day. You shed 10 billion flakes of skin a day. Every, every 28 days you get completely new skin. And this dead skin we shed makes up 90% of household dust. <laughs> so yes, please feel free to vacuum more often. <laughs> Just saying, I don't know. <laughs> and yet, your body, in the midst of this relentless shedding and dying and changing and renewing, continues to remember to be you. Fascinating, huh? <laughs> strand by strand, flake by flake, atom by atom. Your body is made up of around 75 trillion cells, every one of those cells containing hundreds of thousands of molecules with DNA and every cell containing over three billion letters of coding. So you and I are an exotic combination of matter and memory with a fine line in between. You are millions of cells drifting through the universe, assembled and configured 
and finely tuned at this second to be you, but inevitably moving on in the next se seconds, seconds to be other things and other people. And Rob Bell writes, and I'm quoting him now, the atoms that make you you in this very second may have earlier been part of a stork or Mars or a mushroom or a squid or a coconut or Ohio or Buddha or Cher. <laughs> so cells are constantly communicating with each other within our body and outside all the cells that are in constant motion around us. Huh? Amazing. Well, what, then what about our human consciousness? What makes us humans? Uh, a, where is our soul contained? How do we understand that? Well, humans, we are unique in our ability to understand and study the world around us, right? Bacteria and trees and animals don't write poetry, and birds don't ask, why do bad things happen to good birds, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying here, I'm trying. <laughs> but, uh, so we are, we are unique, right, as, as humans. And uh, we are a unique part of God's creation. And let's take a look again at Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. You have that in front if you want to pull that out again. Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. Let's, let's read it together. Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4. Can you read it with me? When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. What are human beings that you should be mindful of them? Human beings that you should care for them. And then verse 5. Yet you have made them more than God. With glory and honor you crown them. So God has, has made us a unique part of creation. We're made in the image of God. And the psalmist points that out several hundred years ago, how our relationship within this intricate creation that God has, has gifted us with. Huh? So what makes you, you then? Your knee and your pancreas and your eyelids are part of your body, but they're not, make, not what makes you, you. And so there's a term that helps in thinking about this, and the term is holism. It's a term that describes how your consciousness and personality can't be located in your physicality. In the same way that your identity and thoughts and fears and favorite ice cream and opinions about Beyonce's singing can't be detected in your knee or your pancreas, right? You can remove and replace your knee and still be you, but you can't hold your soul in your hand. So that term holism is about the mystery at the center of existence. It's the fact that whatever it is that makes you uniquely you cannot be measured or found in any rational, scientific way. Now, people often have a hard time believing that there's a God because we can't see God and we don't have any scientific, tangible proof and yet, talking about God is a lot like talking about our soul. In talking about God, we're talking about a reality that is known, felt, and experienced, but one that we cannot locate in any specific physical space or in any tangible way. And so the early followers of Jesus tried to come up with a way to describe God, tried which is impossible, really, right? To put human language, try to describe with human language that which is impossible to describe. And, and science is helping us to learn even more about how expansive God is, much more than people 2,000 years ago knew. And yet, those early followers, they tried to come up with some description. Uh, and they tried to grapple with a belief in one God in light of their experience of God's amazing activity in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and their encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so over a period of three to 400 years, those early followers would meet together and would debate 
what uh, they believed to be true about God, and that God was one and yet known to us in various ways. And so they came up with what's now known as the doctrine of the Trinity, that uh, we believe that, or that God is known as, as, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Huh? And that's, not a, that's really not a bad description in light of even all the scientific information that we now have. For example, we can think of Father as, as creator or the one behind all the energy in the universe, the one who set up, has, has created it and set it all in motion. Huh? And then the Son of Jesus, we can think of as the, the Redeemer. And you know, how do you get your mind around that? How could God become human in Jesus? Well, that's what quantum physics can kind of help us, right? As we think about subatomic cells forming pathways together and configured into the human person, Jesus of Nazareth, and how God allowed God's self to be confined then within a human body in order to enter into all the, the beauty, the brokenness, and the pain of this, of this world. And Jesus, God in Jesus became a human, died on a cross and rose from the dead. And God did this in order to show that God is love and that God is at work to renew our lives and to renew all of creation. So we think of how all the energy and love in the universe begins with God and emanates from God. And then the Holy Spirit, we can think of as the one who sustains it. The breath and wind of God, the energy that is outside of us and inside of us. Cells that are in constant motion, seeking to renew all things. And so as I said, Rob Bell uh, describes science and faith as, quote, dance partners in which both help us to understand God. And I like to think of how Especially on Trinity Sunday, how much science can help influence our understanding of the magnificence uh, and the power and the intricacy of this creation that, which God has created. Huh? So, you know, in light of modern discoveries, uh, you know, there are better ways, more descriptive ways to describe God than, than that of the Trinity. Maybe, and they probably could help us add some more interesting comments. Uh, to the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, but either way, we continue as, as dance partners with God as we, we explore this amazing life that God has given us. Amen. Amen.
I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the Church, the creation, and all in need. One God, giver of life, you established peace through your Son and gave your church the hope of sharing in your glory. Enlighten us by your Spirit to speak and act in love for the sake of the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator of all, you rejoice in creation and have given humankind responsibility for the works of your hands. Instill in everyone your spirit of care for the earth, especially in areas threatened by ecological devastation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Redeemer, you delight in the human race. Move the hearts of world leaders to seek wisdom, speak truth, and care for all endangered by poverty, prejudice, or violence. Further the work of international collaboration and peacemaking. Hear God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Abiding Comforter, you call out to all who live. Restore severed relationships and protect children who lack trustworthy caregivers. Grant hope to those who are experiencing fear, pain, or grief. Especially Kirk, Bev, Margaret Ann, Sheila, Susan, Minnie, Nancy, Pat, Daphne, Nellie, Ruth, Missy, John, Julie, Caden, Jean, Jane, Joan, Paula, Aurora, Brenda, Elizabeth, Patrick, David, Yvonne, Angelo. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Three, you are community and you create community. Build up ministries that support those who are isolated or lonely. Give endurance as we, make, as we nurture vital relationships in our congregation and beyond. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for reconciling in Christ our monthly basket recipient. May those who serve be touched by your grace to our offerings. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, for what else do the people of God pray? Those prayers, both silent and spoken. For the children on the board. Increase our numbers in diversity. Well, today we pray especially for the people of Uvalde, Texas, and we can only imagine the, the, the trauma that those that community is experiencing. And pray especially for those parents who lost their precious children, and also pray for those families of, of the teachers who were, were also killed. We pray that your Holy Spirit would surround that community and draw close to them and bring them comfort. We pray for all the pastors and chaplains and all who are there to give aid and comfort, that you bless their efforts and be with that community as they try to work through that horrific situation. We would continue to pray that somehow we can work through as a nation to get to a place where we can have, uh, there will not be any more of these, these situations. So we 
Again, pray for your Holy Spirit to guide our, our nation, our, the leaders of our nation, as, uh, as they seek ways to end this kind of tragedy and violence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And today we want to lift up prayers of thanks and celebration. And today we celebrate with Barbara Nord and her family as as they celebrate the anniversary of her birth. But we pray that uh, you would bless Barbara this coming year and her family, fill them with joy. We also celebrate today with Alan and Carol Maley as they celebrate uh, their wedding anniversary. And we would ask that you bless, continue to bless them in their marriage and, and fill them with, with much joy in this coming year. Holy God, we remember your saints for their strong faith and witness, even unto death. Console grieving families. Stir up in us the resolve to end the sin of white supremacy and pursue the courageous path of justice. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his loving kindness endures forever. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name, and fill with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you all. And I also with you. We'll take a moment to share the sign of peace with one another. <laughs> <laughs>
that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. Reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal glory. And so at all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> from the scripture that it was on the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his closest friends, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant or promise in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In this bread and wine, we are reminded that, that Jesus is really present with us here today. If you are worshiping online, know that Jesus is present with you as well, wherever you are. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. You may be seated.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.